Let's join together in the call to worship. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Christ has prepared a feast of love. God is light, in whom there is no darkness at all. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Also with you. Let's join in our first hymn. Just as Jesus did not hesitate to share the cup of wine with Judas, who he knew would betray him to the authorities, Jesus invites all of us, no matter our pain, our despair, our failures, and our faults, Jesus says, come and eat with me, for this grace can transform you. Let's pray together after a moment of silence. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we, your church, confess that often our spirit has not been that of Christ, where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have pledged loyalty to him with our lips and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him. Forgive us, we pray. And by your spirit, make us faithful in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, today you are invited, just like in that last supper, to partake of food that nourishes our spirits and saves our very souls from those deaths. We remember his words that echoed that long ago night to his disciples and that have echoed through the ages. I am always with you. Believe the good news in the name of Jesus Christ 
you are forgiven. Glory to God. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. O oh, merciful God, tonight we take our place at table with our Lord. When he predicts our betrayal, let us examine not our neighbors but ourselves. When he predicts our falling away, let us remember that the crow of the cock is more predictable than any of one of us. As we contemplate his imminent arrest, let us feel not only the pain of our great loss, but the shame of our tragic guilt. Then, as we anticipate his impending death, empower us so to live that he shall not have died in vain. Amen. Our gospel lesson is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter then said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. My friends, during this time of COVID-19, washing has taken on a brand new significance. While we no longer need to wash feet as we come in from outside, we are newly aware of the value of hand washing. Whether you choose to do that now as we sing the next hymn, or whether you do it later on your own, I would encourage you to wash your own hands and or those of someone you live with in conscious imitation of Jesus' actions, doing it with love and with humility. Let us invite Jesus to fill us with love as we sing together. Oh, 
In the spirit of prayer, gracious Lord, I invite you to be present with us in all our scattered places. Be in our hearts as if we were one. Teach us your word. Fill us with your love. Open our lives to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. With gratitude to John M. Brayton, I bring you this evening's message about this day that we call Maundy Thursday. We gather tonight in our separate places to recall in our hearts and minds the events that occurred on Thursday of what the church calls Holy Week, the last week in the life of Jesus. Jesus loved to paint portraits for the soul. He did it through his actions as well as his words. His whole life was a powerful illustration. On this particular night, the image that Jesus will etch into the memories of his disciples will be so powerful that they will never again be able to think of him without reference to this event. The disciples have gathered together in a home, whose home we are not told, but we do know that it had a furnished second floor where they went for the Passover Seder. Writer Walter, Walter Wangerin suggests that the atmosphere of that evening was shrouded in mystery and filled with intrigue. There was the meal held in secret and the carefully plotted plan. Listen, the householder said, let's use a signal. I'll send a man with a jar of water through the city. Now, usually it would be a woman carrying a jar of water. Men would bear, bear the wineskins. So that was a pretty clear signal. He said, have your disciples follow him. No words, no talk, and I'll furnish the upper room. The stage was set. The time was ripe. One by one, the disciples came, trudging along dusty streets to celebrate the Passover with Jesus. It was to be their last supper with him. They entered the house and waited for the Lord to come. As they sat there, they began to quarrel. They were quarreling over who would be the greatest among them in the kingdom that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to establish. They wondered which one of them would be in what role in the king's cabinet. Who would be in the position of greatest power? Who would have the Messiah's ear at a time of political or religious crisis? Each had reasons for assuming that they would play a major role. Certainly the enthusiastic demonstration of the people which accompanied Jesus' entry into Jerusalem would thrust Jesus into the political forefront and initiate the coming of his kingdom. They were sure of it. That discussion apparently prevented them from carrying out the usual foot cleansing, which usually happened when one entered a room. And because the roads were dirty and dusty and because people wore sandals, everyone who came into the house entered with filthy feet. Normally a servant, the lowliest person on the staff, was assigned the dismal duty of removing sandals and washing the feet of each person who arrived. The disciples, seeing that there was no one present to carry out the task, knew that they should take turns at that job, but nobody moved. They all sat there with their grimy feet, glaring at each other and jabbering about who was the most important. Nobody took the basin and no one reached for a towel. Each one wanted to be served. Each one refused to wash another's feet, stooping down. And so they sat self-satisfied and somewhat sullen until Jesus came. Then Jesus, who was the greatest truly, the one unto whom all power and heaven and earth had been given, humbled himself. His hands gripped the basin and the towel and he calmly and lovingly began to wash their feet. The shocked silence screamed in their ears as Jesus went from disciple to disciple to disciple. Shamed, 
They watched as their Lord carried out that menial task. In this act, Jesus became the servant. Imagine, just imagine for a moment, God on his knees because of the arrogance of the disciples. I suppose they would ever forget that image. When he finished, he said to them, do you understand what I have just done for you? I'm sure the disciples nodded their collective heads, but understanding it truly was beyond their understanding. Jesus went on to say, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now I, your Lord and teacher, have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, Jesus was not suggesting that they go about the countryside washing people's feet. That misses the point altogether. In fact, the modern custom of foot washing is an anachronism. Once useful, it is no longer necessary. Although I have been in worship service where it was extremely meaningful. Tonight, we symbolically washed our hands to remember that gift of servanthood. But Jesus did not deal in simple symbols. He did what needed to be done and did not observe customs and rituals for their own sake. The example Jesus burned into the memories of his disciples was a portrait of a servant. He wanted them to know that the highest calling in life is not to be served, but to serve. God called them, as he does us, to minister to the real needs of others. That's the way Jesus used his power and authority. That's the way the disciples are to operate in the world. That's the way we, as his disciples today, are to operate in this world. To ensure that they understood, Jesus said, Gentiles lord it over others, but it shall not be so with you. Now some would see this statement as an admonition against using power and authority, but quite the contrary. For if no one is empowered, there cannot be progress in the world. If no one is given authority, there is no accountability. Even the most egalitarian societies, in order to remain viable, must have dynamic leadership through dynamic individuals. Power in itself is not evil. The pursuit of power is not incompatible with God's design. The passion to learn, the pursuit of excellence, all evidence of our desire for power have been implanted in us as part of the image of the divine. Jesus promised power to the apostles before he ascended in Acts 1, verse 8. What is at issue here is not the idea of power, but how it is used. Jesus saw power not as an instrument of control, but of caring, as a vehicle not of submission, but of servanthood. Would that we could all see it that way. Would that we could see it that way being used by those who are in power and authority in our world. Jesus had given his disciples a powerful image to remember him and a model for living a life of faithfulness. And then, while they were at table, he gave them an even more powerful image as he shared the bread and the wine with them. I can imagine another shocked silence as the significance of what he is doing slowly sinks in. Jesus reached out for the basin and the towel to serve the disciples. He offers them the bread of his body and the wine of his blood, even though he knew them well enough to know that each one of them would betray him and desert him before the night is over. While the disciples were thinking of themselves, Jesus, in whom the power of God lived, emptied himself and gave himself to those for whom he cared. He didn't worry about himself how he felt, whom he could impress. In his humble but powerful way, Jesus began to transform the thinking of his disciples. Each time that we gather at table, we see again the symbolic portrait painted by the Lord centuries ago in that upper room. The scene drawn by Jesus that night in the upper room was one of a powerful servant motivated by an unrelenting love. In that moment, the disciples were given an illustration of such impact that it would remain in their memories as long as they had breath. He loved without embarrassment. 
who loved without reservation. He loved without requiring love in return. And he says to us, as he said long ago to the disciples, do you know what I have done? I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So that as I was sent to serve, so I also send you. That portrait could not be clearer. I invite you into a few moments of silent meditation and then pray. Let us pray. Eternal and ever blessed God, you sent your son Jesus into the world to be an example to us. Help us to walk in his steps. Help us to walk in his humility, so that we too may be among our fellows as those who serve. Help us to walk in his forgiveness, so that we too may forgive as we hope to be forgiven. Help us to walk in his courage, so that nothing may ever deflect us from the way we ought to take. Help us to walk in his endurance, so that nothing may daunt or discourage us until we reach our goal. Help us to walk in his loyalty, so that nothing may ever seduce our hearts from our devotion to him. Help us to share in the life that our Lord once lived on earth, so that we may also share the life he gives in his risen power. Grant that it may be our sustenance to do the will of our Father who is in heaven. Grant us to take up whatever cross is laid upon us and gladly and gallantly carry it. And grant that as we share his cross, so we may also share his crown. And as we share his death, so we may also share his life. And grant that having suffered with him, we may also reign with him. We ask all this for your love's sake. Amen. invite us to thank God for all the things that God has given to us and let's dedicate the offering together. Gifting God, all that we have came from you. All that we are was first a part of you. These gifts and tithes we present now are but simple tokens of the riches you first gave to us. Take our pledges and use them for the work of the church. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, as we prepare for communion, we're going to move to a different part of the sanctuary. First Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 26, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, almighty God, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. We come as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. And together we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. 
Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us in all the places where we are scattered. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of food and drink, wherever they may be. Lord, make them holy for us, as the body and blood of Christ is holy, so that we may be for the world, as the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one, one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until that day when Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. reading the Passion of Jesus Christ according to the book of John, translation. Excuse me, yes. Oh, by James Charlesworth, sorry. He had translated it with special sensitivity to the Jewish origins of Christianity. And so I begin. God is light in whom there is no darkness at all. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and we loved darkness rather than light.
Javi. Got it, John. You want me to unmute it? Oh, yes, I think you're all set. Okay. Ready? Yes, thank you. Jesus went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Jesus, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he has spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of Judean authorities seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the religious authorities that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman who guarded the gate said to Peter, Are not you also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jewish people come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, Are not you also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. Then they led Jesus from the high 
house of Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The religious authorities said to him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken to show by what death he was to die. Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the religious authorities. But my kingship is not from the world. Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king, for this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is the truth? After Pilate had said this, he went to the religious authority again and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate, go ahead, sorry. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the religious authorities cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the religious authorities, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. They handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The Jewish chief priest then said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Carol. 
Carol, would you read, please? Carol, your phone is muted. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, they parted my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast cloths. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of vinegar on his and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Julie, you're muted. Thank you. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the religious authorities asked Peter that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it was born witness his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the religious authorities, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body, Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, 
they laid Jesus there. As we sing our next hymn, imagine yourself beneath the cross of Jesus. strip the church in silence.
Let us pray together. And now, O oh Lord, let your servants go in peace to watch and wait with the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer and fasting, in silent reflection and in thanksgiving. And may God's blessing be with us tonight, with all those who need your blessing, O oh Lord, be with us today and in the days to come. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, 